the Temple of Artemis, in any ancient source, was noted to be one of the greatest if not the greatest structure ever built. Originally designed by the famous ancient architect Chersiphron in 550 BCE, it was built to honor the goddess Artemis, the god of the hunt, wild animals, and wilderness, and paradoxically for both childbirth and virginity. This temple was constructed almost entirely from gleaming pearly white marble with pillars of cedar that had been treated with perfumes and oils. Just from this, you can start to imagine how big of a project the Temple of Artemis was. To ensure that the temple would remain standing for as many years as possible, the temple was specifically constructed on a marshy land. While this may seem foolish, there was a reason behind choosing a softer ground, and that was so the building may be protected from earthquakes. But obviously, constructing a building on marshy land would lead to a number of obstacles but Chersiphron was able to manage them quite well. The foundation area was reinforced with charcoal and sheepskins. Then layers of shale and marble were laid down to create a flat surface, which they could start building the structure on. Many were in doubt to exactly how they managed to create such a solid foundation, and it seemed pretty bizarre to use all the thousands of sheepskins that would be needed for that. But archaeologists have found remnants of carboniferous elements and fragments of organic origin when examining the soil around the temple's ruins. With further excavation, archaeologists have come to the conclusion that the ancient builders really may have used charcoal and other materials to ensure a solid base of the temple. But the use of sheepskin is still debated. Upon this rather strange foundation, the ancient builders built an impressive building with 127 gleaming white marble pillars that held up the roof of a 377 feet by 180 feet massive structure. Modern estimates based in historical accounts suggest that each of these pillars were single pieces of marble over 60 feet long and weighing about 100 tons. How they managed to carry such heavy marble and erect it at a time when there was no crane or bulldozer, is still a fascination to us, and especially to the people of that time. Ancient travelers and worshippers were most definitely impressed and simply awed by the massive size of the temple. Experts estimate it took as little as 10 years to as much as 200 years to finish the construction of the temple. It appears that the main body of the temple may have been constructed in the first 10 years, but then it was constantly being improved on for until in 356 BCE. A man named Herostratus destroyed it. What? Destroyed it? After all that hard work for 200 years? Yes, and because he thought it was funny. Yes, of many crazy people we often see in history, Herostratus was one of them with maybe a better sense of humor than all of us. Now, how a single man could destroy such a huge stone building with probably many guards for its protection is intriguing and impressive if you think about it. How did he manage to do it? And knowing the consequences of getting caught after vandalizing a temple held sacred to the people? Herostratus was one crazy man. The large temple stood without any major incident for about two centuries until on July 21st, 356 BCE. Herostratus woke up one morning, rolled up his sleeves, and got ready for demolition. Now accounts say Herostratus simply snuck past the guards and got to work. But what were the guards doing really? Gossiping probably, while Herostratus managed to put together a costume of a wild animal and just go past them into the temple of the god of wild animals. Maybe, who knows. He was said to have placed various oiled rags around some of the wood-framed pillars that helped support the roof and let them on fire. The destruction of the temple came as a shocker to the citizens of the town, who thought it was impervious to conventional damage due to the massive size, but they forgot that a loony could set fire to the corners of the building. What the bigger surprise was, was that Herostratus came out walking in style with his head up smiling, showing all of his teeth saying, I did it. Herostratus openly admitted to the crime and handed himself over to the authorities. And guess what happened immediately after that? Everyone rushed to him and picked him up over their heads and cheered him. They too didn't like the color of the marble. Of course not. He was immediately tortured and pressured to reveal the reason 
to why he burnt down the temple. Why do you think he burnt it down? Knowing from the fact that he handed himself over, he was willing to take the punishment. But why? Apparently, Herostratus screamed that he did it so that his name could be remembered in history. He couldn't find a better way. Well, if you think about it, he did accomplish his goal. We are still talking about him two millennials later. Fearing other criminals who would attempt to do similar to what Herostratus did, the authorities made sure Herostratus was brutally and very publicly executed. They made sure that all the people saw his end and deteriorated them into committing any similar crimes of arson or worse. After that, they removed his name from all public record and announced among the people that whoever would even utter his name in public would be executed. That may have worked on the people at that time, but not down the line. Every story and every secret does get exposed. They failed in the attempt to excise him from history, all thanks to a Greek historian in the 4th century who decided to share with us and all the future generations the story of Herostratus and the true fate of the Great Temple. But unfortunately, they were successful to a certain extent. They were remarkably thorough in destroying anything even related to Herostratus. But that didn't stop later historians to try to figure out the man who destroyed the temple. Plutarch hypothesized in his writings, it was this coincidence which inspired Hegesias of Magnesia to utter a joke which was flat enough to have put the fire out. He said it was no wonder the temple of Artemis was destroyed since the goddess was busy attending the birth of Alexander. But those of the Magi who were then at Ephesus interpreted the destruction of the temple as the portent of a far greater disaster and they ran through the city beating their faces and crying out that that day had brought forth a great scourge and calamity for Asia. But if we consider the fact that the town of Ephesus, where this all happened, was 900 kilometers from the birthplace of Alexander and Pella, there was no way Herostratus could have known that a child had been born in the royal palace. And then, we would also have to assume that Alexander was born on the same time, or say, before the burning of the fire, so Herostratus, after hearing the news, would go and burn it down. Another point is that Alexander had just been born. He wasn't Alexander the Great yet. I don't see why any common man would worry about the hair of a distant future ruler. And from the mouth of Herostratus himself, he did it for fame and for being remembered, which coincides with the fact that all his information was erased as a consequence of the crime. However, years later, during the rebuilding of the temple, Alexander the Great offered to fund it with the condition that his name would be inscribed on the temple. But according to historical sources, the people of Ephesus refused as they thought that it would be inappropriate for Alexander the Great, a god, or son of the Greek god Zeus, to dedicate offerings to another god. And then, the local citizens raised the funds needed through donations of money, jewelry, property, for the reconstruction of the temple. Although the temple was reconstructed with as much hard work and labor as the first time around, it was destroyed and looted after six centuries when enemies raided the city in 260 to 270 CE. But its final end came around 400 CE with the rise of Christianity. Bringing the spotlight back to Herostratus, I would say it's very unfortunate that we don't have all the details to what had happened and what exactly was this man like. His desire to be remembered in time was apparently stronger than not wanting to be brutally tortured and killed. But Herostratus still lives on in our very language, as we use the term Herostratic fame to describe the actions of people who commit crimes for the sole purpose of acquiring fame or notoriety. Lastly, who knows if we will be remembered in time at all. For sure, there were great men before that we don't know anything about today. The words of people's mouth will be lost or changed, but if we leave something behind that people can benefit from after we are gone, then rest assured people will remember and cherish you for your contribution to the society.